Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, crafting machine, resource spawn areas, a janky UI, some awesome building capsules, heat mechanic, and a spawn manager. So here's the progress that I made in my game this last week. Now, as you can see, this is a new format that I'm trying out, so let me know what you think. And stick around to the end where I will ask you some design questions that I currently don't have an answer to that perhaps you can help. As soon as I finish writing the very first devlog, I get back to work on the game. As always, the challenge is combining working on the game and continuing to make regular videos. But thankfully, this past week, things actually went quite well. I was still busy with regular videos, took some time to edit the previous devlog, then I had to get the 22 LTS video done, and I was also editing a really awesome video for next week. But I did manage to work on the game for maybe about four days full time, so I was able to do quite a bit of work. I managed to implement quite a lot of these systems. The game is definitely starting to take shape. Although right now, I'm actually working against a pretty strict deadline. I've got to get a working build of the game ready by the 10th so that I can have the build reviewed by Steam and ready to go live for the festival. In case you don't know how Steam works, the first time you upload a build, you have to go through their manual review process, basically so they can verify that the game works and has nothing malicious in it. After the first manual build review, then you can easily upload any new version without issue. So that means I only need the nice polish demo done by the 19th, but in order to have time to go through the review process, I need to upload a working build at the latest by the 10th. So anyways, if I keep working like this, like I did this week, then that should be doable. On the last devlog, I already had quite a lot of mechanics, so now it was mostly just continuing to build upon it. I already had all of these buildings and all of these moving vehicles and container buildings. Once again, thanks to the power of writing good clean code, I was able to easily add tons more features really quickly. First was the crafting mechanic, which obviously the game has to have a crafting mechanic. Personally, I love crafting in just about any game, so of course I wanted to add it to my own game. Thankfully, it's actually pretty easy. Crafting really just means inputs and outputs. I actually made a video quite a long time ago on how to make a nice crafting system just like Minecraft. That one is using scriptable objects, so here I'm doing pretty much exactly the same thing. The one big design question is do I use a container building for the input and another one for the output? Or do I just toss the output item right in the air? I end up going with throwing the output item just because I think it's a bit more fun to watch the item as it flies away. For selecting the recipe, that was actually the tricky part, or not necessarily tricky, just very time consuming. Building the entire UI definitely took much longer than expected. For some reason, I thought I could quickly build out all the UIs for all the machines in about one hour, but I was definitely deeply mistaken. In reality, it took more like six hours to get it all working. One really tricky part was the UI for selecting which container building is linked. Now, I want the game to have lots of interlocking systems, so all the buildings are nicely separated. The crafting requires an input, but the crafting building doesn't come with that input, so it's up to the player to construct a container building and then link them both together. This way, all the buildings work very well with one another, which makes the player have quite a bit more ownership over the world, so I think that's fun. I use render textures to show all of the nearby container buildings. I also covered render textures in detail in a previous video. It's a really awesome Unity tool, you should definitely know about them. But making the UI was really tricky. I refactored the code for selecting the link container building about five times, constantly writing and rewriting code, which I guess this is a teaching moment. So regardless of how experienced you are, and I do have quite a lot of experience, I still write and rewrite and refactor tons of code. I definitely don't get it all working the first time. So if you don't write your code perfectly the first time, that's perfectly normal. That's exactly what happens to everyone. So anyways, I want it to be really well written since I knew lots of buildings would use this same element. Now, if you want to learn how to write good clean code, then check out my free course in the multiplayer expansion. Alternatively, for a more advanced level, check out my turn-based strategy course, which I just recently updated with the second free expansion. Anyways, back to the game. So the UI took quite a lot of work. It's very janky. I definitely need to remake this for the final demo, but for now it's functional, so that's good enough. I can go up to any building and interact with it to open up the UI for that building, and then I can modify the settings for that building. By the way, the way the interactions work is I'm using a real nice interface, just like I covered in the nice NPCs video. Then the next step was handling the building. Now initially my first thought was, why don't I do it just like I've done in pretty much all of my games? Meaning just have some buttons at the bottom where I can select what building I want to construct and then just click to place it. Now that works very well for mouse based games, but this game is meant to be more controller friendly, so I didn't really want a button overlay. My solution is actually something that I'm very happy with. I made some proper objects to hold essentially the building blueprint. Now for me, I love Dragon Ball and I love the sci-fi capsules that Bulma makes. Just a tiny capsule, then she throws it around and the building is constructed. So here I did pretty much exactly that. I made some more objects. These are regular carry objects, so any object can carry them. However, they extend the base script object class to add some more data for which building it is. Then I easily added the recipes for all these objects. Obviously, none of the inputs are real. Right now, they all just cost one green gem, but they will have a proper building cost. Now, the next mechanic is a simple but very important one. The game is meant to have lots of resources, but obviously resources have different tiers. The basic star resources should be easy to gather, but then other high-level resources, those should require some special tech together. 
The solution that I came up with was to make a resource area, which is where a resource exists in the world, and then I define how many of those resources are spawned natural. So for things like basic apples, which is the food that the dinkies eat, for this I can just make them spawn constantly, but then for purple gems, which are a much more advanced resource, for this one I made it so that nothing spawns constantly, but the resource area is still there. In order to get resources, the player needs to resource some kind of fracking machine, which when placed on top of the resource spawn area, it suddenly spawns some resource. So this is another nice mechanic, which works alongside all of the other regular machines. Now, I've actually got a design question to ask you related to this mechanic, but before that, here's the last two mechanics that I worked on this week. First is an extremely important mechanic, which is the heat mechanic. Honestly, I don't know if that's quite a good name for it. I'll definitely have to think about the name a bit more, but basically every game needs some sort of antagonist, and in this case, it's the zombies, which want to eat the dinkies. So I want a mechanic that will handle basically how these zombies are spawned. I didn't want to have just a basic wave spawn timer that the player had no control over. I want it a bit more skill based. And I also want to encourage the player to think carefully about how they set up all of their automation machines. So my answer to that design problem is the heat mechanic, which defines how many zombies are spawned and how often and how the heat is calculated, that one is based on loose objects in the world. Basically objects like the output for the mining machine, these experience pellets, the building capsules, the heat manager simply cycles through the entire map and counts up all of these objects. Basically, this mechanic is meant to encourage the player to make their colony nice and efficient rather than just gathering resources non-stop. And it also has a fun secondary benefit since it encourages the player to clean up the world. It also actually helps in terms of performance since all of these loose objects, these are all physics objects. I also want this mechanic to be kind of self-correcting, meaning kind of like dynamic difficulty. If the player is doing badly, then it will essentially become easier. So if the player has tons of objects all over the place, then there won't be tons of zombies spawned and those will then overrun the player and eat all of the dinkies. But then, as that happens, the zombie spawn amount and intensity, that one is based not just on the heat amount, but also on the dinky amount. So as the zombies eat a bunch of dinkies and a bunch of objects, then the difficulty will essentially go down. That way, if the player messes up and is overrun, it's not an immediate game over, but it will destroy tons of the colony, and at the same time, make future waves much more easy so they can take their time to rebuild. Now, the next mechanic that I worked on is the opposite of this one, which is the dinky spawning. I had a rough idea for what I wanted, but I still need to sit down and think exactly what do I want. I know that I want the dinkies to be based on houses, the player built some houses and then dinkies simply spawn from those houses. So I refactored the house to have a list of dinkies, all the dinkies that were spawned there. There's a limit of dinky per each house. Then every X amount of time, basically the dinky spawner goes through all the houses, finds all the houses that still have a valid dinky position and simply spawns a brand new dinky. So right now, this is really just the bare bones design for this mechanic. And then next week, I want to flesh this out quite a bit more. Speaking of next week, here are some design questions that I'm thinking about that maybe you might help me answer, as well as what I'm going to work on next week. So first design question is related to the resource node spawn areas. Right now, I'm just placing the game object in the editor, but obviously the player needs to be able to see where these resource node areas are. Now, the first obvious answer is some kind of overlay. I've actually done that pretty much in every single one of my Steam games. There's always some overlay to see some more data. But just like what I mentioned with the UI, that doesn't really seem to fit this game. I really want this to be more controller-based, more world-based. So right now I'm actually thinking something more like an item that the player can equip, which then enables them to speed the spawn areas, something like some kind of radar. And then that actually leads me to the second design question, which I also don't have an answer for, which is if I give the player the ability to hold special items, how exactly am I going to do that? So do I do some kind of invisible infinite inventory? That's one approach. Or do I keep the player holding the items just like they can right now carry some physical objects? Personally, I really like the physicality of seeing the player holding the objects, but obviously that limits the player to just holding one special item at a time. Now, technically that design can be fun, especially since the main goal is for the game to be multiplayer. So I do like the idea of having players work together as a team and each carrying a different item. But at the same time, that could also become more annoying than interesting. Yet another related design question is what am I going to do about combat? Now I'm thinking the player would be able to hold some kind of baseball bat or some kind of mini pistol to really take out the zombies. But again, do I go with an infinite invisible inventory or do I force the player to carry and drop the weapon? Like I said, these are still questions that I'm thinking about, still don't have a clear answer, so let me know your thoughts on these design questions. Now here's what I'm planning to work on next week and some more design questions. First of all, I want to implement the power system. Right now the buildings, they all work for no cost. I want power to have a cost. I'm thinking about making some kind of power object that the player can then feed into the machines. Then I want to implement the trash mechanic. Like I said, the heat mechanic is all based on loose objects. So I want some way to destroy those objects and that's where the trash mechanic comes in. Basically, the player won't be able to have some kind of building where they can input something and just destroy that object. Then I also want to work on tier two dinkies and crafting. 
Now I'm thinking along the lines of something like Anno, where some higher tier people require some more complex items. Then I also want to implement some more automation interactions. This is another design question, which is right now, I like how the automation interactions work. So I've got a mining machine, tosses an item, then the item grabber picks it up and drops it on the container counter, and then the moving vehicle moves it around. Those are good, but at the same time, all of those machines pretty much just interact with one other machine. I want a bit more complex interactions. I want each machine to be able to work with a variety of others so the player can really flex their creative muscles. So I definitely need to think long and hard about that. And then I want to implement the game end goal. The idea right now is you repopulate this world with tons of dinkies and then basically construct a rocket to fly out into space and then colonize another world. So I need to make the mechanic for defining the goal and then sort of record the gameplay to see if the world is safe so that the player can actually exit. Finally, the most important thing that I really need to implement is actually an obvious one, which is implement networking. Right now, the game is only single player, but it's obviously meant to be multiplayer. It is meant to have both options. And in order to make the belt for review, I do need it to have working multiplayer. I have no idea how complex this task will be. I did really enjoy working with Netcode for game objects. That was surprisingly easy, but still, this could be quite difficult. So perhaps next week, this is actually all that I'll be able to do. But still, this week was very productive. Hopefully next week won't be the same. So stay tuned for the next devlog. Now, as you can see from this video, I'm experimenting with a different style for these devlogs to hopefully make them a bit more interesting. Let me know in the comments if you like this style for more general devlogs. I'll probably keep doing regular videos just without camera, just a voiceover whenever I do some kind of deep dive, like the one that I'm planning for the automation mechanics. But for general devlogs, I think this style might be better. Either way, let me know in the comments. All right, so go ahead and Dinky Gardens your wishlist. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.